All right, so um, I'm going to have a brief presentation about the Moodle Universal Cache, uh, which is going to go in my pocket, um, which has been around since Moodle 2.0, I think, or 2.1, and has changed quite a bit the performance profile of Moodle and has had a very important impact in how we use and experience and configure Moodle in, at, at the end of the day. So, so. I'll go very quickly over a little bit of history. The first question is why do we need a special cache for, um, for Moodle? And one of the key things to be aware of is that when we use PHP, every page that we serve, every URL that we serve, starts from scratch. The PHP engine does not remember anything from the prior request. So we have to say which files to load, which files to compile, uh, potentially, and out of, um, kind of, at the outset of serving that page, it has no configuration in memory. We overcome that by having a good precompiler, a caching precompiler, which now is standard in PHP, but for many years we did not that have we did not have that as a standard in PHP. So people would use eAccelerator or APC or different forms of, of cache. Now it, almost everybody's using PHP 5.5, which includes opcache, and that's all these things um, out of the box. However, it's important to remember that that's not that the mental model or the um, the general model of PHP is that every request starts from a blank slate. And that's different from other languages, um, sometimes used in, in web development, uh, such as Java or, or Python or Perl, where you can load up a server, load up certain amount of configuration and variables, and then serve pages. We, we don't get a chance to preload that. And because Moodle has much of its configuration in, in, in a database, um, that puts us in a situation where we have to be fetching a lot of information from the database. This makes Moodle very configurable, but it makes a bit more work. So the cache is very important, um, and being efficient about how we retrieve things from the, from the database is very important. During, um, during the 1.x, uh, during the history of 1.x, which was fairly, fairly um, long, we spent a lot of work working on caches, but it wasn't very successful. It was successful, but it, it, didn't, it didn't have the, the, the desired impact. We did also do a lot of work on improving a little bit the code flow and how we ran a, um, SQL queries, and that had a fantastically positive impact. It was also a lot of work because, different from a cache, this had to be um, on a per area of code. It was a lot more work intensive. So we did all that work, right, a lot of we, a very generous we. Um, a large group of people applied a lot of work there. And, um, and so over the 1.x era, Moodle developed, improved its, its scalability basically by improving code flow and improving SQL code. Now, when we went into the 2.x era, that wasn't enough. And at the same time, we had, I guess, we had learned enough about <clears throat> dealing with caching code that the Moodle Universal Cache was written. And it has a much better API, a much better implementation. It's a much more useful cache. However, something interesting happened. We, had, we built the Moodle Universal Cache and almost no code made use of it. Because to use the Moodle Universal Cache, you actually, the code has to change to use it. And very little code in early 2.x um, versions used it. It is from 2.7 onwards that we have most of the Moodle code, perhaps all the Moodle, Moodle code base, using intensely um, the, the Moodle Universal Cache. And so now we are, in another stage, in another era of, of the of performance profile for Moodle. So still, when we use, we use the Moodle cache because it's enabled by default, but it's very, very hard to configure if you want to stray from the default. So 
one of the questions that I've had for a long time, and I'm supposed to know about performance, I've been doing this for a little while, and, and I've been daunted by the Moodle Universal Cache configuration. One of the things that I found that I had to sit down and study all the configuration, and it was, uh, sounds ridiculous, but I was, I was quite confused about it at the beginning. And although all the terms, because I'm familiar with it, because I, was, I didn't implement it, but I was part of the early, early discussions when we were talking about the uh, late in the 1.9 um, cycle, talking about the design of the Moodle Universal Cache, I should know about it. But it uh, took, took quite a bit of reading and sussing through the code to understand what the hell is going on. But it is, it is really complicated. And it's hard to build up a mental model of what things each type of cache will do and how it will exactly um, work out. And the documentation is very good about, um, about what each item will do. And then it says, well, go out and test it, right? And that's fine, but it's fairly hard to test. And it's very hard to test reliably. It's very hard to measure and to know what are the right measurements. So I set out to do a bit of work for that um, and to, le to learn and to figure out how I should configure the Moodle cache and what, um, what I could say, you know, what, what I could document and, and communicate about it. And this is a little bit the story, the, the story of, that, of that work. So the stack used for this uh, experiment that has lasted for the last couple of months, not hasn't been my only, my only uh, the, hasn't been the only work on my disk, but it's been pretty intensive, um, has been I have worked both on hardware and virtual machines. I have worked, when I have worked on hardware, I have worked with hybrid drives and SSDs. Um, all the work is based on Linux. All the work is based on um, RHEL 6 or RHEL 7. And um, also a little bit of testing on, on recent versions of Fedora to understand what's happening with newer code. All the work has been done using Apache and PHP in two modes, mod, mod PHP and uh, using uh, fast CGI, which is very similar. If anybody here is using Nginx, the performance profile of using Apache with mod, mod fast CGI um, is very similar to using Nginx. Um, it's been based on MariaDB 5.5 and recent versions of PHP. To further, to, for more detail about, about what the focus was, we, we were working on, on relatively simple configurations, looking at how a straightforward one machine configuration or a small cluster running in a virtualized environment will perform in different, with, different, um, with different configurations of, of, the, of the Moodle Universal Cache. We wanted to keep the configuration simple, so any configuration advantage that requires too complex of a setup gets minus points, obviously, because it's, it's a big hassle to set up, and if it's brittle or if it's complex to maintain, that all adds to the work we, we have to do, and we want to keep it streamlined, we want to keep it simple, easy to upgrade, easy to manage, clear, easy, you know, clear and, and straightforward to monitor. That's, that's, a key, that's a key goal. And in general, we wanted a better understanding of how Moodle performs under pressure. And so, what did we use for measuring, for, for, to take our measurements? We worked, um, we worked our way through several large Moodle installations. So we took an example data set from a large customer, a remote learner, and we um, picked up some reference pages, pages that were popular and notoriously heavy. So essentially, we picked up the Moodle homepage and a few other key course pages. Right, that's, that, those are traditionally the pages with the most content and the content coming from the most diverse array of Moodle plugins, right? Because the um, Moodle course page will require different things from different, different blocks and different, different uh, Moodle plugins. So um, those are the pages we use. We switched off some of the authentication controls and we use Apache, sorry, we don't switch off the authentication, but we basically provided a cookie, an already authenticated cookie to Apache Bench, and we run the system through Apache Bench performance. Now, some people will use um, JMeter. Are you folks here familiar with JMeter? So with JMeter and similar tools, 
you take a tour through your web application and it captures all the traffic and then you can replay it. That's an alternative approach. It's more laborious and, um, and quite a bit less practical if you want to change what things you're testing. And it's also very prone to giving, um, giving different results and, different, um, and sometimes somewhat, somewhat muddled or, or, or false results. So we use a Apache Bench, which is very simple, request this page or request that page. And we complemented that with visiting the pages in real time while we're load testing to see what an end user, what, what the actual perceived, um, perceived uh, user experience is. Does it load quickly in my web browser? Or does it load half a page and get stuck and then load another half of the page? Or does it load the page but not any of the associated resources? It's a, it's a combined approach that allowed us to move faster and test much faster than if we, we had used a more in-depth test of each run, which we did many, many runs. And when we did want to look at a particular run, um, we did go very deep, but over a particular run and over a particular type of, of request. So while we are load testing and throwing a lot of traffic at the server, we would run one query with the PHP profiler on. So we would get a very clear pa a very clear record of where time was spent in execution. And what we found was extremely interesting. So the Moodle Universal Cache is very well used. So Moodle today issues very few database queries. And that, that's very good news. So that, that's excellent news. And on the other hand, we see a huge number of queries to the cache itself, which is good, but it's a tricky aspect of good because um, what we find is that the, the flip side of the cache performance is that we see that any change in latency to, on the, um, on the, with regards to accessing the cache has a big impact on the overall times. So, <clears throat> we basically focused on local cache because we found that the shared cache didn't make a large difference. And working on the local cache, we worked, we tested uh, Memcache and Mongo, but found that the latency, the added latency, um, made the performance quite a bit worse. We essentially found that the, no the standard file cache, which is what is enabled out of the box, is fairly good and it's what you should be running, and that's what you are running anyway. And we did find that after a little bit of work and a little bit of patching, um, there's an in-memory cache, which is based on the old APC, which is APCU, which can be loaded in a modern PHP 5.5. Um, that's even faster than uh, local files, probably by a factor of 10. Now, Here's the thing, we can make the cache go much, much faster. However, it does not change the overall page load time. It does not change the time to serve pages. We're hitting the cache a lot and the per request time is 10 times better if we use APCU because it's in memory and it doesn't incur the cost of calling the kernel to retrieve a file. The, the kernel is very fast because it retrieves a file that is essentially in memory, but by skipping the kernel, we can get each request much faster. However, it did not matter. It moved, it, it only improved overall results very little, less than 5%. And so we went to the PHP profiler to find out why. And the reason why is that we spend something like 20 to 30 percent of our CPU time. We are heavily CPU bound when we are under when when um, a web server is under a lot of traffic, and we spend more than 20 percent of our time running muck code. So, um, so the improvements are real. The overall the overall improvements are real. And, but the, you know, when we are developing, we all, and we're working on performance, we work on one bottleneck. And so this bottleneck is resolved, and now, well, now there's the other bottleneck, right? 
And that's, that's, in a sense, that's always how it works. And so we have resolved, in a sense, um, MUC has been very successful about um, resolving the bottleneck in terms of database access. And it has, in turn, well, has expanded what we can do uh, in a single, uh, single machine installation or even on, in, a, in a cluster setup. But it has moved the ball to, um, to MUC itself. So from an admin point of view, from a Moodle admin point of view, <clears throat> it's the, 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 my conclusions are simple. You can just use local files. The standard, the, the default is a good default. You don't have to stress about it. You don't have to worry about it. Use, use the file store, it's okay. Um, <clears throat> however, for the development team, um, the, the results are a little bit of an interesting, of an interesting uh, challenge because we spend what seems to, at first blush, a lot of time just deciding which which cache store are we going to query? And this time is significant, right? Um, I did work through the profiles and it wasn't clear. It's not like there is one particular function that is a hotspot. There, there wasn't a particular place where we were spending all the time. It's spread all across the MUC. So the question is, can we devise a strategy to simplify and to streamline the Moodle Universal Cache, perhaps might be even worth to lose some capability or to lose some option um, in order to cut this down significantly. Because one of the key things when you're developing a cache is that it's going to be used a lot. And, um, and so the code that is supposed to uh, make your application faster, that code itself has to be very efficient. So my, um, I was already talking uh, with Dan here, uh, one of my projects for the Hack Fest on Friday will be to look at what we can do on that front. The other aspect that I think is interesting is that um, it's perhaps of secondary order because the defaults are very good, but I think it's worthwhile um, to look at whether we can simplify the configuration. Now, with these changes, with, with, with the changing of performance profile that comes from uh, from the improvements uh, in Moodle, in recent versions of Moodle, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, one of the things that changes is that we used to be heavily database bound. The, da the database used to be the thing that held, uh, held Moodle back in terms of performance. And now that has shifted and now we are very, very strongly CPU bound. And <clears throat> in that context, one of the f extremely strange findings is that reducing the number of Apache processes or, or of PHP processes improves the response times, right? And that is a very counterintuitive um, conclusion, but it has the, the ideal number of PHP processes is a multiplier, usually uh, two times the number of CPUs dedicated, the number of cores dedicated. That's a very, that's, that's, that's a radical change from the type of configuration we did for Apache in years past. Anyway, has that been geeky enough? Has that been technical enough? Okay. Um, anyway, um, we do have five minutes, I hope. Did I? So currently, it seems like we're set up perfectly then because our web server has 24 cores. And, and, and so, yes, but we're looking at examining um, uh, Amazon Cloud, et cetera, uh, in, in, in other ideas. So, and we also just use one web server. So that lends itself to using the, the local cache, the file cache. How do you have multiple web servers and local, uh, local file cache for the, for the MUC? Is it, do you use, uh, how does that, work out? So, okay, so one, one of the things is that um, uh, you have, so the local cache will store things that are safe to store locally. Um, and um, so it will be distinct from, 
from the, the cache that has to be shared. The, once you have a cluster yes for the shared cache, you do have to use memcache or Mongo. I, I think in that space what dominates, or in, in our testing, what dominates there really is the TCP latency. So you need to work on, on, on your network. You need to make sure that it's as fast as you can. Um, and you probably want to run Mongo um, as, as a cache rather than as a store. So there's the option to tell Mongo um, to basically give you asset-like warranties. You don't want that, right? You, you want to say, go fast and lose. It doesn't matter if you lose your data. So that's what you can do to uh, make sure that the writes are as fast as you can. But the limitation on reads is going to be um, your latency. So I do have a few ideas to improve, um, to, to reduce the impact of latency because we issue lots and lots of queries. I'm gonna work on that at the Hackfist. Uh, and that should improve the performance, the plan that I have should improve the performance of stores that are shared, such as Mongo and, and, uh, and Memcache. And the plan that I have should apply to all of them, shouldn't be like just a fix for Mongo or just a fix for Memcache. We'll see how it works. Um, so you were saying about using Apache Bench rather than JMeter. Yes. But uh, presumably you're just doing very primitive get requests uh, and no posts and no dealing with session, you know, session keys and all that kind of stuff. I mean, with JMeter you would do, you could do more complex performance tests. Yes, yes, so it is admittedly a narrow view. Um, my intent was squarely to force a lot of work on the Moodle cache. So, um, Yes, sessions uh, are a concern, and in a sense, what I've done is I have um, worked my best to remove them as a factor, right, from this testing. Um, reasonably, like, if you put your sessions, so if your sessions, um, your sessions can run fairly well on NFS and can run uh, fairly well on, on Memcache or Mongo, but um, you only do one fetch. Although the session is sizable, you, it's, it's just one fetch and perhaps one write per, um, per request, right? Um, whereas we are issuing maybe what, a couple hundred reads and, uh, from, from, the, from the Moodle cache. And let's say I did my best to remove that as a factor from the variations I tested, right? I'm, Yes, there's, there's also work um, to be done there. Um, to it's kind of follow up from the question or comment over here, um, we did a bunch of work on clustering memcache uh, for latency reasons. Um, and we added that in core in 2.7, I think, maybe 2.8. Okay. Um, uh, so basically you get zero latency on reads, but at the sacrifice of latency on writes. Um, and I'm curious if you'd looked at that feature set any. I'm guessing by the face, the answer is no. <laughs> we can talk after this. Yeah, I'm interested in that. I'm really interested in that. Yeah. So you get, even if the, you get zero, zero latency on reads, even if the store is, is in a different system? No, different it's, the way that it works is that uh, uh, we call it clustered memcache and it's you have a memcache instance on each front end and the, the, the store configuration is such that it. when you write, you write to everybody, but when you read, you read from the local host version. Right, so, so on the writes stores, are very expensive, I understand. Yeah. So on stores like strings, Right where it's very rarely updated, but very heavily read, you get a huge perform well, huge in a sense performance yeah. benefit out of that, um, because you're never updating, but you get near zero latency on the read because it's just on the local machine. So that's, that's, that's something I look at. I haven't seen it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm keen. I'm keen on catching up about that. Uh, I'm pretty new to the caching within Moodle idea, but how, how do expirations usually work? Is it 
always on a schedule or are there certain actions that cause caches to expire or how is that coordinated by the universal cache? Um, the, if, oh, okay, if I remember right, the expiration on the file cache, um, so the API allows you to say the time to live, which marks an expiration. Different um, cache backends will use that differently. Um, I think memcache handles the expiration internally, so you just, uh, it just gets handled by memcache. For those backing stores that don't have native support for it, we store the expiration inside the payload and check it. Maybe, maybe we do find a payload, but we read it and say, well, actually it's stale, so we, we won't, um, you know, uh, the, the driver for, for that uh, backing store will not, will say, I didn't find anything because it found something, but it was old. Um, in terms of the file um, store, um, we did find that it did not effectively, it, I'm not sure if it didn't happen often enough, but we found that we needed to prune expired entries more aggressively than Moodle did. So we ended up, uh, we ended up uh, running a few extra cron jobs to clean up uh, file stores. But, uh, but there, is an there is a TTL and it is, and it is enforced. Uh, but you could end up uh, you could end up with entries that exist in the in the cache store um, that are expired. You, you know the code will read them and um, and not really report it back to the calling to the calling um, code the, the code that uses the cache. However, they can uh, add to the burden of carrying the cache, right? So. Sometimes it's, for some backing stores, you might need to run a cron job to clean it up, to, to prune old entries. All right, I think that's all the time we have today. Thank you, Martin. Give Martin a hand. Thank you.